saying it's his first Zoom meeting, so welcome. Nice to see you. Um, I'm really excited for our presentation today. Thank you so much to uh, Sydney and Patrick for joining us um, from Great Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve in colorful Colorado. <laughs> I'm Caroline Lochner. I'm a Regional Program Manager with Western National Parks Association. And again, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you, since this may be a first Zoom meeting for some of you, um, you can find the chat at the lower port portion of your screen. If you click on the chat and you can enter any questions that you have um, for Sydney and Patrick, and I'll make sure to ask them at the end of the presentation and get those um, questions answered for you. All right, and so it's really great we can interact through that uh, chat function throughout the presentation. And so uh, to kick off their presentation and uh, our introduction is going to be by our uh, WMPA CEO, Jim Cook. Take it away, Jim, and let's celebrate International Dark Sky Week. We're going to unmute Jim. Look how we have this power that we've just muted Jim. <laughs> now, Jim, okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Caroline. And indeed, I'm sure that's a dream often is to mute Jim, um, but uh, we can't get away with that now. Well, welcome everybody. Um, uh, indeed, so wonderful to see so many familiar names and faces. Thank you so much for not only joining us today, but staying engaged with Western National Parks Association. We know that you're hungry for information and experiences about our national parks and uh, what a delight to partner with the Great Sand Dunes and uh, hear from our dear uh, partner uh, rangers at the park. Uh, these are the folks that we work with uh, day by day in helping interpret the stories and the history and nature of the, of the parks. So uh, welcome everyone. And I'm gonna introduce our speakers now. Uh, first, we have Sydney Stover. She has a master's degree in history and has been a national park ranger for eight years. She has worked at many different national park sites across the country before arriving at Great Sand Dunes in 2018. Sharing star stories with visitors at the campgrounds is her favorite thing to do as a park ranger. Wonderful and welcome Sydney. And then we have Patrick Myers. Uh, he began as a seasonal park ranger working in three different parks before starting full-time at Great Sand Dunes in 1998. Duties include a full range of interpretive programming, publications, website and social media, and visitor services. His favorite programs are evening programs focusing on experiencing and understanding the night environment and sky. Well, with that, um, again, welcome, Sydney and Patrick. We're all so looking forward to your presentation. So take it away, and hopefully the host has unmuted you as well. All right, thank you so much, Jim. And we, uh, we at Great Sanders, uh, deeply appreciate Western National Parks Association. Um, you've made a great difference in our park, and I know we're one of the busiest uh, stores uh, in the WNPA network. Um, so we do, we have a great relationship with WNPA and deeply value uh, this partnership. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, can everybody see my screen? Good. All right, so we often like to start out with a question. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you are muted or not, but uh, just something to at least think about if you can't answer, go ahead. But how has NASA space exploration shaped your perspective of our world? Just think about growing up and 
the things you've seen on, on TV or, or whatever on the internet, how has that shaped your perspective of our world? Any two or three of you want to give your perspective on that? Don't be shy. So Anne is saying that uh, she has a friend from college, Tom Marshburn is an astronaut and uh, she loves seeing his view from space. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. Anybody else want to go ahead and put in an answer in the chat? Uh, Mike says it makes the Earth seem so minuscule. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's continue on then. So. It definitely has shaped you know, my perspective. It, it, you can see there's a view, uh, the, the bottom right picture there is a view from one of the Apollo missions looking back at Earth. And just like um, you just shared, that, that it gives a, a perspective on how small our planet is and the, and the vastness of space and how uh, an even greater urgency to, to protect it, to protect our natural and cultural uh, resources. So, you know, do you ever feel disconnected though, as you're living your day-to-day -day life? It seems like we're more and more disconnected from each other in our modern world. And, you know, we may, uh, even when we're surrounded by familiar things like our town or our city or our nearby park, sometimes we feel like there's something missing. We, at night, we see the familiar city lights where we live, but nothing beyond them. So maybe it's time to come to the wilderness and look up. Because the Great Sand Dunes and many other locations throughout uh, North America are, uh, at least the Great Sand Dunes, our extreme environment, our high elevation and our dark night skies provide this astonishing otherworldly window into our solar system and the universe. And because Great Sand Dunes is, um, is like other planets, because this, uh, this extreme environment here, NASA scientists have been coming here for decades to study this strange environment and to test equipment that would help us understand environments on other planets such as Mars. So let's explore the final frontier from the dunes to the moon and beyond. But before we look up in the sky and, and look at other places in our solar system, let's first take a closer look at Great Sand Dunes. Many of you have never visited this park and let's see why NASA scientists continue to come here to study these dunes. Now this uh, NASA scientist study how great sand dunes are forming. You can see in this animation, you can see large lakes uh, that dried up over time over the last uh, thousands of years. And as they diminished, the sand left behind blew towards the mountains and piled up in a pocket of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And this is actually a view from the International Space Station, another NASA mission. This is a zoomed down view from the International Space Station of Great Sand Dunes, showing how it's formed in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And as we're gonna see, dune fields on other planets, actually other planets do have dunes on them, are often formed in this same way. And Great Sand Dunes is also similar to other planets because of our temperature extremes. Uh, we can reach, it's been as cold as 40 degrees below zero here in the wintertime. And then in the summertime, the sand surface temperature can reach 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And though it's calm here most of the year, uh, winds can reach 50 miles per hour during storm fronts. And this is our windy time of year in the spring. And also, the, you know, the visitor center at Great Sand Dunes is located at 8,200 feet. And park elevations reach all the way um, up to above 13,000 feet. So the air at this elevation is thin more like the thin atmosphere on Mars and other planets. And even though there's lots of water flowing off the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in the springtime, the San Luis Valley floor is a true desert. And the barren dry sand is harsh to normal life forms. But a few types of plants and animals can survive these extreme conditions. So life forms that, are, that thrive in harsh conditions are called extremophiles. And if there are any life forms elsewhere in our solar system, they would likely have to be extremophiles like the great sand dunes tiger beetle, which can survive these severe conditions. Uh, for instance, tiger beetles have a heat shield 
on their underside and they do stilt walking to get their body off the hot sand surface. And then in the winter, they can tunnel down into the dunes over 15 feet to stay below frigid surface conditions. All right, so let's look up at our night sky now. On a clear moonless night, the sky above the dunes is a true window into our universe. And the sky here is clear and dark because of our location far from city lights. And this is a photo of North America at night from space. And you can see uh, Denver there. That's the lights of the front range cities of uh, Colorado. And then to the southwest of that in that dark space there, that's where Great Sand Dunes is located. So it's truly a dark location. The Sangre de Cristo Mountains help block the, the city lights from those other cities. So our dry air and high elevation also help us to see the stars more clearly where we are. And in 2019, Great Sand Dunes was certified as an international dark sky park. And we had to meet many high standards for maintaining our dark clear skies here in the park and surrounding, and surrounding the park as well, working with partners. So let's first lift our eyes from the dunes to our closest neighbor, which is the moon. Half a century ago, Apollo astronauts trained in national parks to prepare them for visits to the moon. And Apollo missions brought astronauts to the surface of the moon where they struggled to climb lunar mountains that are like dunes with a soft sandy surface. You can see here an astronaut struggling to get up this sand dune like formation on the moon. But the fun part was when they got to hop down in the low gravity environment and they felt like they were jumping down a big sand dune on the moon. And exploring great sand dunes on a full moon night is a surreal experience with an eerie light and an otherworldly landscape. It's like being on the moon. And coming down is just as much fun. All right, let's next explore farther, a little, little bit farther into our solar system. We're going to go to the planet Venus, which is often visible over the dunes at just after sunset. And NASA has sent a number of missions to fly around Venus and scan through its thick clouds. And these scans show, high, show sand dunes piled up against a mountain range. And you might think the surface of great sand dunes is hot, but it's 160 degrees, but the surface of Venus can reach over 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And Venus was once more like Earth. This is a little video kind of going back in time showing the history of Venus. Venus actually had large water lakes at one time, but natural climate change uh, turned it into an oven and, and evaporated all those away. So next let's travel from Venus past our home planet Earth to the mysterious red planet, Mars. And you can actually sometimes see Mars over the night sky above the dunes. It's actually visible right now in the night sky above the dunes. NASA's first missions to Mars were in the Viking landers in the 1970s. But before NASA sent a Viking lander to Mars, they sent one here to Great Sand Dunes. So the success of their test mission here gave them the confidence to move forward to send a lander to Mars, giving us the first glimpse of uh, the surface of Mars. And then later Mars missions have shown us that the dunes on Mars are actually quite similar to great sand dunes. In the top photo, you can see a dune field on Mars has been formed in a pocket of hills, just as the, like the bottom picture, great sand dunes was formed in a curved pocket of mountains. So here's a pop quiz for all of you, see so if anything gets this one. Uh, one of these aerial views is of dunes on Mars, and one is great sand dunes. Is great sand dunes on the top or the bottom? You can put it in the chat or if you're... <laughs> what do you think? Any answers? Any guesses? Okay. Great sand dunes on top or bottom? Some people are... Most people are guessing the top. They're thinking it's the top. Oh, we have a bottom. Well, somebody, okay, it's kind of half and half there. So 
Yeah, so Great Sand Dunes is on the bottom, as a, uh, or on the top, rather. Uh, that's a photo I took flying over at sunset one evening, and then that's new, uh, Mars on the bottom. Here's another pop quiz, closer view. Are these ripples on Great Sand Dunes or Mars? Great Sand Dunes or Mars? Okay, Mars. People are thinking Mars. Mars, they are correct. Oh, we got, now it's dunes, dunes. dunes half dunes. and half. About half and half, okay. So yeah, this is actually Mars. It does look a lot like Great Sand Dunes. So obviously they're very, very similar. So because of that, NASA scientists do continue to come here and study the, the Great Sand Dunes to help them better understand the dunes on Mars. And NASA scientists also learn more about the dunes on Mars through rover explorations. And you may have noticed in the news this year, uh, the Mars rover Perseverance has just landed uh, very recently on, on Mars. The previous mission, Curiosity, was focused more on geology, but the uh, Perseverance is, is looking for signs of life on Mars, doing some drilling and things like that. To, uh, and that's actually taking place right as we speak. It's driving around and, and collecting samples right now. And NASA also sponsors a sand robotics challenge each spring at Great Sand Dunes to help young scientists learn about the technology that goes into Mars rovers. Also in this region of our solar system, Comet 67P was recently photographed. And the um, comets are basically large chunks of ice and rock that orbit our sun in an irregular elliptical orbit. They don't have their own atmosphere, but this, a solar wind, as they get closer to the sun, the solar wind sweeps across the ice and the particles there, and it actually can form sand dunes. So this is an amazing discovery that sand dunes are even found on comets. So let's move even farther out into our solar system, past the asteroid belt, past Jupiter, and around the planet Saturn. And NASA's Cassini spacecraft flew past Saturn on its way, took some pictures of Saturn and studied that, but then it was on its way to uh, one of Saturn's moons called Titan. And Cassini launched a probe that captured video as it descended to the surface of Titan. So we're gonna actually watch a real video taken by this probe as it descended. So this is the actual video from NASA took as it descended into Titan, going through these golden clouds. You'll begin to see some landforms emerge on, the, on Titan. The lighter forms are mountains, and then uh, the darker forms you see, especially to the right there, those are sand dunes on Titan. And we're going to actually watch the landing here as it comes down. That little white dot in the lower center is the, the goal there. Boom, there we are, right on the surface of Titan. And unlike uh, Earth that has flowing water and, and water uh, oceans, things like that, the, the rivers and large lakes on Titan are made of liquid methane, which is kind of bizarre. So the dunes on Titan are actually made of um, frozen fragments or, or grains of uh, frozen methane 
that blow off of these lakes as they, as they change, and that forms Titan's mysterious dunes. Okay, let's continue even farther past Uranus, past Neptune, all the way out to the outer edge of our solar system and to the dwarf planet Pluto. And the New Horizons spacecraft traveled at 36,000 miles per hour and it still took nine years to reach Pluto. So here we are approaching the uh, approaching Pluto. It's a very rugged mountain, a rugged uh, rough planet, dwarf planet. It's uh, typical temperature is about 387 degrees below zero. And as we come around, we begin to notice these whitish areas on the right. So let's zoom into one of those and we're going to find out that that is a sand dune. <laughs> Even on Pluto, there are sand dunes. And this is a kind of a pretty one. It's shaped like a heart. And each of these, within each of these dune fields on Pluto are these pale linear dunes. They're thought to be, again, frozen grains of methane that have been blown into the thin atmosphere, piling up, piling up against a mountain range. Uh, reminds us, mind you, a little bit of White Sands National Park. And then we can continue on though beyond our solar system. Uh, deeper through the Milky Way galaxy, we can see the Eagle Nebula and what NASA calls the Pillars of Creation. These are dust cloud formations that are larger than our solar system. Let's zoom into a different part of our galaxy. We have white smudge there. That's, you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy on a clear night uh, at the Great Sand Dunes with your naked eye. But this is a zoomed in uh, photo of it, of uh, Andromeda, which is our closest galaxy. And it's got billions of stars within it. And it's just one of billions of galaxies in the universe. So the universe is absolutely huge. But you know, you don't have to travel all the way to outer space to experience an otherworldly landscape. We have one right here at Great Sand Dunes. And while we haven't yet found any life on other planets, there are plenty of unusual creatures right here at Great Sand Dunes. There's seven insects found here in this national park, but nowhere else in the world. And one of these, the Noctuid moth, is the color of moonlight. Camel crickets also emerge at night in the dunes and leave these uh, kind of train track like. Uh, tracks the following morning. Or you might be walking out and you might find a whole bunch of different kinds of tracks together and you might wonder what happened here. It's kind of like a CSI, a crime scene investigation. So let's find out. If you go look in the lower left of the scene there, you can see a little silky pocket mouse scurried through the scene. And then a couple of desert cottontails, a rock squirrel. From the right, a kangaroo rat hopped by. But then the tracks end right in the middle. What happened? An owl swooped down and caught the kangaroo rat. So that's the scene that I found the following morning. So as you visit Great Sand Dunes, go out there and look and you can find some nighttime stories that are written in the stand. See if you can figure out what happened. And beyond the dunes, you can listen for owls calling in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. We have eight species of owls in this mountain range. So being in a place such as Great Sand Dunes leads many to want to capture the night sky in photos. And you've already seen a number of my photos in this, uh, in this presentation. This is the most recent night photo I've taken showing the, uh, on the left side of that dark silhouettes is, is cottonwood trees. The wide uh, water in the foreground is, is Medno Creek, which flows along the base of the dunes in the summer, early summertime. And then on the right, you can see the edge of the dunes there. And then right above the whole thing is the Milky Way galaxy. Basically what we look at in the night sky is the edge of our Milky Way uh, galaxy. So here's some basic tips uh, just you're thinking about taking pictures. First of all, plan your photography for a clear moonless night. Uh, some people don't think about it. They just plan their trip when it works out for them and they go on a, on a bright moonlit night and they really don't see very many stars at all. If the moon is out, you really 
can hardly see any stars. Now the bright, and you also have to think about the time of year, the brightest part, part of the Milky Way is most visible midsummer through fall in the evening hours. So if you try to go out in the evening right now, you're really not gonna see the bright part of the Milky Way. This time of year in the, in the late spring, it's, it's visible in the pre-dawn hours. So if you wanna get up when it's uh, kind of dark and cold <laughs> early in the morning, you can, you can see the Milky Way right now, but most people like to see in the evening. So that'd be midsummer through fall. And on your camera, you need to have manual settings, be able to use a shutter speed around 20 seconds, um, use the widest aperture setting you can, you can use to open up your, your camera basically. Use a high enough ISO, ISO is the sensitivity of your camera if you, you make it sensitive enough to capture the light, but if you put it too high, your picture is gonna be very grainy. So you're gonna have to just experiment with the settings of your particular camera. Also use a very wide angle lens like 28, to 25 to 28 millimeters. And some of the newer iPhones and uh, other, other brands have a night mode where you can use a longer exposure, but you can't handhold that. You can't ever handhold a night shot because it's too, you're gonna have to uh, set it down or put it on a tripod to get a steady picture. And just a couple of ethical considerations of the night sky. Um, please don't over process your Milky Way photos. Or, or, or promote images like these. These, mis, mis, these types of images mislead the public. This is not what the Milky Way looks like. It's a very soft, whitish cloud of stars uh, across the sky. It doesn't look like colorful fireworks like these pictures do. Another consideration is light painting. Uh, some photographers like to shine bright artificial lights on the foreground to light up their scene. Um, not only damages your own night vision if you're doing that, but it also diminishes the experiences of other visitors that are out there trying to enjoy the night. And it also damages the fragile night vision of nocturnal animals. Uh, for instance, owls uh, have such sensitive night vision that they can be blinded for up to 30 minutes after you shine a bright light in their face. So dark sky parks such as Great Sand Dunes are refuges for nocturnal animals, but they're also an amazing window for us into our solar system and all the way into our galaxy and even our universe. And these give us a fresh perspective on our world. We can be humbled by the immensity of it all and, and really inspired by its intricacy. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to Sydney and she's gonna give you some more practical applications of how to view the night sky and, uh, and how you can do that even in your own neighborhood. All right, can you see my screen? Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone. You just experienced a, a sample of what an evening program is like at Great Sand Dunes. Um, we often talk about different topics of the night sky and Patrick introduced you to the topics that he enjoys sharing at the campground. These evening programs are followed by a conductive activity involving stargazing with telescopes and rangers and volunteers guiding people through star tours at the campground. And so I'm gonna try to do that for you today virtually. So I'm gonna share with you some tips and tricks so that you can stargaze no matter where you are in the country. And as somebody who I was introduced earlier and my favorite thing about being a park ranger is sharing star stories in the night sky at the campground. Because here at Great Sand Dunes, we're blessed to have the darkest night sky in the state of Colorado. And we're, we're a protected area. We're an international dark sky park. And so we have such amazing stars that are for the many visitors, the first they've ever experienced in a dark place like this and also feeling safe coming to Ranger program. And I had that same experience. That's what actually inspired me to learn about and share the night sky. I was a visitor to a national park. I went to a national park by myself. I saw an advertisement for a star program and I went and I found myself in a empty parking lot at night with, 
I couldn't see faces. I couldn't see, barely see people. And there was just these disembodied voices sharing amazing facts and information about the night sky above our heads. And I was in a parking lot in a campground in a national park and it changed my perspective forever. I walked up to one of these large telescopes you see on the right with a step stool and I looked into the lens and there was a planet. The planet I saw in that telescope was Neptune and I was speechless. I'm still in awe to this day when I think about this amazing experience I had. I looked at a planet that I knew at the time you cannot see with your naked eye. I knew at the time this planet was not even discovered through sight. Um, Neptune was actually discovered through mathematics. Scientists were studying Uranus and they're, they're looking at the orbit of this other planet and they're like, wait, there's, there's something bigger out there that's pulling on its orbit. It's, it's interacting with this. They did the math, they pointed their telescope and they found a whole new planet. And there I was in the middle of nowhere, looking through a lens and seeing it. I was in awe and I wanted to share this with everyone. I wanted everybody to experience what I experienced at this STAR program. And I have been able to do so with the National Park Service across seven national parks. I've been a night sky ranger. And I want you to experience this too. And you can do it at home and hopefully work towards a goal of visiting a night sky park to experience it. So here's some of my pro tips and tricks to help you night sky view at home. So start off by scouting the area around you. Look for a dark place where you can safely see the open sky. It can be a park, it can be a schoolyard, a backyard, a patio, or even just a window. You don't even have to be outside as long as you can see the night sky. And there is this ex expectation that to stargaze, you have to go someplace dark. You have to travel and, and plan. You can't do it at home. And that is not true. You can learn the night sky from your home in the inner city and hopefully over time venture your way into that excellent dark sky that you hear about. And I've got some good news for you too. So many corp companies and organizations are actually working towards becoming night sky friendly. So even in major urban areas, you can find places where the lights are shielded and it's offering more darkness than, than in the past. So this is a great example of a gas station. It's got shielded lights that direct the focus of the energy straight down. And you can see the dark areas on the outside of the gas station where there's less light pollution, less light glare and a better sky. Corporations are learning that this not only benefits them because it's cheaper, it saves so much money on energy, but it also is great for public appearance because they're preventing um, migrating birds from getting distracted by their buildings and their lights. And they are also benefiting people who enjoy the night sky. So as you're scouting around your neighborhood and around your, the outside of your house or apartment complex, just look for the better lighting fixtures. Those are shielded. They keep the focus downward instead of blurring and creating glare around the whole area. And you can just walk the block. You can drive around the neighborhood and try to find a darker place to practice and learn your stargazing. So you can find shielded lights more and more as more and more people are becoming aware of light pollution. It's the only pollution that can be fixed by just turning off a light switch. So next pro tip, it is good to always check the weather. This isn't just a stargazing pro tip. This is a life pro tip. Check the weather every day. And so with stargazing, it helps in so many ways. One, to be prepared. Are you gonna be able to actually see the stars? Maybe it's gonna rain, maybe the wind is gonna to be too strong for a telescope, check the weather. Here at Great Sand Dunes, we always use weather.gov every day. There's so many websites and cell phone apps with the weather. We trust weather.gov, the National Weather Service. They even have a cool feature where you can move 
the forecast area to your house or to the top of a mountain or even the parking lot or a, or a park or a school. And it will pinpoint the forecast for that area instead of the default, which is oftentimes an airport on the other side of town. So weather.gov. Now, if you are getting deeper and deeper into stargazing, maybe you've got a telescope, I recommend the clear sky chart. This is the one for Great Sand Dunes for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It tells you those high altitude clouds that aren't often forecasted in the normal um, weather forecasting. So what's the transparency? Is there a smoke from wildfires? Is there a pollution um, threat that could interfere with your night sky viewing. So check out the clear sky chart for your area. And they're just really fun to just look at too for the various national parks that they cover. Next pro tip, find out when the moon will rise and set and what phase it will be in. Patrick mentioned this, people plan stargazing around their work schedules, but the moon oftentimes can um, make that a little difficult for them. The moon for me personally, is the coolest thing about the night sky. I love the moon. I, I, it's fascinating. So I recommend as a beginner stargazer, learn the moon, learn the phases, and it's just a lot of fun. When the moon is slowly getting brighter and brighter and turning to full, it's waxing on. When the moon is dimming lower and lower, eventually to new, it's waning off. So it waxes on, it wanes off. The, the moon is just one of the most interesting things in the night sky, if not the most interesting thing. If you live by the ocean, learn about the moon and how it impacts those tides. If you live in the mountains, learn about the moon and how it reflects off of the snow in the winter and makes it brighter. The moon is fascinating and I definitely recommend learning or at least taking a chance on taking a full moon hike. Like Patrick mentioned, it turns the dunes into another world. It is so fun to go on a full moon hike at every national park I've ever been to, especially here at Great Sand Dunes. It makes the dunes look like an ocean that doesn't move. It's eerie, otherworldly, and just a ton of fun. You'll hear people out there, even though you can't see them, just laughing and giggling. It's one of the best experiences you can have in a national park is getting out when the moon is out. It is so much fun. Next pro tip, learn the basic parts that make up the night sky before you focus on the astrophysics. So one of my favorite quotes by Albert Einstein, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. And that's especially true of the night sky. So I'll go to star parties and so many volunteer astronomers, they know their astrophysics. They can riddle off the chemical composition of the stars. They can tell you that the star Vega is 2.5 light years away. But can you actually find the star Vega? So it's good to learn the basics first. So this is how I teach everyone from kids to adults how to first understand and read the night sky. It can be a little overwhelming. You're looking at just this massive sky of stars, lots of different dots of different sizes and different shades. Sometimes it's hard to connect them to see recognizable patterns or constellations because especially at Great Sand Dunes, it can be overwhelming and it's hard to even find the Big Dipper. But consider the night sky is the same as a map of the United States. A map of the United States without the states light laid out, without the highways and the cities labeled, I mean, some people might even have a hard time finding where they are, even though they know this land and they've seen this map so many times. But remember, you've seen this before. You, you know if you take a moment, you know the land features, where the Rocky Mountains are, where the Mississippi River is. And I bet if you think about those major land features, and where you are in comparison to them, you can find yourself on this map. The night sky is the same. It's just a giant map. And once you learn the states of the shapes or the states of the con or the shapes of the constellations, you'll eventually be able to find your way around the night sky. Now, the constellations on this big map in the sky have been whittled down and standardized. Across human cultures, there's thousands of constellations in the night sky thousands of constellations, myths and star stories, 
But in the 1930s, the International Astronomical Union got together and they whittled it down. They standardized it to just 88 constellations that are standardized and recognized by the scientific community today. The reason they did this is so that scientists across languages, across cultures can communicate with each other. So that a scientist in Japan might be studying an object in the constellation Leo the Lion, that scientist can communicate with a scientist in Spain about this object they're seeing in the constellation Leo the Lion, two scientists, two different cultures and languages, and they can communicate with what they're finding in the night sky by using the standardized constellations. So 88 constellations that we use today are mostly Greco-Roman, Arabic, there's Southern indigenous cultural constellations that are used and recognized in some modern day um, ones as well that are mostly instruments like telescope is, a, is one. So they took those constellations, those 88, and they basically turned them into zones, areas, states on the map of the night sky. So just like there's states on the map of the US, there's states in the night sky, the constellations. Again, 88 of them. So just like a map of the US, there are interstates that cut across the country traveling through different states. There is an interstate in the night sky, a highway in the sky, and this highway cuts through 12 constellations. And from our perspective on Earth, this highway in the sky, it's called the ecliptic, is very important. It cuts through the 12 constellations that make up the zodiac. So everybody's heard that before because they have their own zodiac from their birth. So the ecliptic, that highway in the sky, is a very important transportation corridor for the planets, the moon, and the sun. So from our view on Earth, the planets, the moon, and the sun stay on this interstate, this highway in the sky called the ecliptic. So just like our map of the US has roads, the sky has a road as well. Now, just like our map of the US has important cities that are highlighted, there are bright big stars that have names. Not every star in the night sky has a name. There are thousands but the brightest ones all have names assigned to them. Just like a map of the US, those big cities show up, even though there's all those tiny little towns too, the big cities are always labeled on our map. In the night sky, those big bright stars and planets show up too. Now, just like a map of the US, you gotta have a key. You gotta have a way to point north. And the night sky has a star that does that for us too. Not the brightest star in the night sky, but definitely the most important and that is Polaris, the North Star. Now it's pretty easy to find Polaris once you know how to look for it. You find one of the most recognizable shapes in the night sky, and that is the Big Dipper. Believe it or not, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. It's what we call an asterism. It's a smaller picture in the larger image that is a constellation. So the Big Dipper is a tiny picture inside the larger constellation Ursa Major. If you can find the Big Dipper, you take the two stars of the bowl furthest from the handle and you just follow them to the North Star Polaris, which is the last star in the Little Dipper. And this is how you can find the North Star. And this is important because for people who are not familiar with the North Star, it is a fixed star in the sky. From our view on Earth, all the stars appear to rotate in big circles that get wider and wider the closer to the horizon, except the North Star. The North Star is fixed, so all the stars appear to rotate around it. And this is why this star is so important to ancient humans that navigate it, even today to us stargazers and people that like to nav navigate the old school way. Next pro tip. Learning a couple of constellation stories is a great way to begin the learn to learn the night sky. Use the constellation stories from your heritage. Share your family and your traditional constellation stories just as much as you share the more modern day recognized constellation stories. There are so many thousands of constellation stories across time 
and cultures. Share what you know. Ask your grandparents, your relatives. Ask Google what the her your family heritage star stories are. There are so many, and they are all equally as important as the recognized constellations. And a great example is Ursa Major, or the Big Dipper's larger constellation. This constellation, Ursa Major, has been seen as a bear by cultures around the globe for 13,000 years. We humans, our ancestors, and our children's children will see a bear in these stars. And there's different stories and different myths associated with the bear. American Indians saw the bear being followed by hunters, and the Greco-Romans believed the bear to be a human woman that once lived and then she was turned into a bear by the gods and they grabbed the bear's tail, spun the bear around, launched it into the night sky and stretched its tail out, which is why this is a bear with a long tail. So there's many amazing stories that are fun to learn and a great way to learn the night sky. And I recommend starting with that Big Dipper. The Big Dipper, again, seen as a bear with a tail, seen as hunters chasing a bear. And to Northern Europeans, it's actually not a bear. The Big Dipper is a plow. And so a great way to learn some more constellations is to find the Big Dipper and use its handle to arc to the star Arcturus. And then you find the constellation Beotes. Beotes in some of the myths is actually the inventor of the plow. And the Big Dipper is the plow that he invented. And if you go to the star Arcturus and you spike down to the bright star Spica, you find Virgo, who is the goddess of the harvest. So you've got the goddess of the harvest, the inventor of the plow, and the tool that helped spread agriculture around the globe. In these three constellations and those three simple connecting stories, you have found three constellations and Virgo, one of the zodiac. Therefore, you have now also found that highway in the sky that travels through the zodiac. The planets, the moon, and the sun are all on that line. Next pro tip, use free maps and apps to get started. You don't need to go out and spend a ton of money on gear and information. You can get free apps and free information online. You can get some good books and some really nice um, firm star charts at the park stores, but definitely you can find some really great stuff for cheap and free. Here at Great Sand Dunes, every month we give visitors a copy of the evening sky map. This is from maps.com. The first of the month, every month, they issue a free star chart for both the Northern and Southern Hemisphere, and they've got the calendar of celestial events throughout the month. Is there going to be a meteor shower? Is there going to be an eclipse? This right here will tell you and tell you what constellations to look out for during this month. On the back, there's really great tips, as well as what you can see with your naked eye, what you can see with binoculars. And if you already have a telescope, that's great. They'll give you some tips to that as well. There's so many great apps out there that are free as well. I mean, just go online. You can't go wrong with any of them. And they're so much fun to use. Even if it's raining outside, it's snowing, you can stand in your living room and look at the night sky with these apps, literally in the comfort of your own home. And it's a great way to stay connected to the night sky, learn the night sky, even if you're not outside under the stars. Here's um, some resources too. These are sites that I, as a night sky ranger, visit every time I have a star um, tour or some kind of program I'm planning. I go to see what the sunrise, sunset is, the, 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 what the stars are gonna look like at that very time. And these are the websites that I have bookmarked and I go to every single time. NASA has so many great learning tools and resources. Just play around on nasa.gov. You can learn moon phases, constellations. You can learn that astrophysics if you're interested in the chemical compositions of everything too. So nasa.gov, free, amazing resources for everyone. Next pro tip, you do not have to buy expensive equipment to enjoy stargazing. You don't. If you if you're a park person like me, and I'm assuming since you're part of Doug BMPA, you are, I bet you, you already have some binoculars. Binoculars are literally just 
two telescopes welded together and you'd put them up to your face, they work amazing for night sky viewing. So here's some tips to help you better use binoculars to view the stars. First off, focus on your eyepiece. Are you wearing glasses or are you just rocking eyelashes? <laughs> if you're using glasses, make sure to bend the flip, the, the lens piece, the eyepiece down. This way you don't have too much between your eye and the lens. Your glasses are plenty of blockage. If you're rocking eyelashes, you need to make sure those flat pieces up so that the eyelashes don't bend when you're looking and actually block out the stars or blur the stars. Those little hairs on your eyes can actually distort your view, even if you're birding, let alone stargazing. So make sure to read your manual and your binoculars so that you can get the most out of them, especially stargazing. Now, another tip I have for stargazing is don't walk around while looking through binoculars at night while you're trying to stargaze. No, not good at all, no bueno. So you wanna make sure that you stay in one place, you look at the star and you keep your view on the star. Do not move your eyes from the star. Slowly bring the binoculars up to your face and lo and behold, the star will appear. If you're looking around like this, trying to find everything, these objects are so far away from you, you can make yourself seasick and, or maybe not even find them if you're moving around like that. So keep your eye on the star and bring the binoculars to your face. It's the best way to find the object and enjoy your time and see more objects instead of fighting with your binoculars. Next pro tip and final pro tip, stargazing is free. Your eyes are free. The night sky is free. Look up and enjoy the night sky wherever you are. You don't have to be in a perfect dark place on a perfectly dark night. Embrace the moon, embrace the fact that you live in a place that there's some light. It's not the end of the world if your night vision isn't perfect. The first step to stargazing is to just stargaze. Get out wherever you are, learn the stars, learn the planets, and just be outside under the stars. Our chief of resource management here at Great Sand Dunes, Fred Bunch, has such a fun saying. Every time he talks about the stars, he says, you have a right to starlight. And you do. Again, it's absolutely free. Wherever you are, just get outside and enjoy the starlight. I hope one day you all can make it to Great Sand Dunes. You can see Mars, you can see the Milky Way, and you can enjoy the full moon hikes out on the dunes. But wherever you are, I just hope you enjoy the stars. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sydney. That was amazing. And so please, everyone, if you have any questions, please place them in the chat. Um, I have a few questions for you, Patrick and Sydney, while we're waiting for some others to come in. Um, uh, first, I, I would love to go and visit uh, Great Sand Dunes. You mentioned a full moon hike. Do you have to have a guide for a full moon hike or can you go on your own? And are you currently providing that um, service? I can answer that one. So it is all self-guided. The park is open 24 seven. You're allowed to come in at two in the morning if you want. You can come in for sunrise and um, no guarantee there'll be a ranger there to help you. So definitely do your research, but no, we are an international dark sky park and you're welcome to come anytime, day or night to go hiking. We do not have any formal um, moon hikes this time of year, maybe as the summer progresses, but nothing scheduled at this time. Okay, well, that's, a, that's awesome to know that we can just do that and go at any time and have a self guided hike. That's really great. Um, I also wanted to know, are there any night sky events that we can look forward to in 2021? Is there something like a must see um, or any type of uh, events coming up in 2021? So every year towards the end of summer, we try 
for an annual star party, the name changes every year from an astrological event to a star party and so on and so forth. But it tends to be August and September once our monsoon season has kind of wrapped up. This year, I wanna say it's around August 15th is when it's gonna be. And so you can look on our calendar of events and see what the requirements are as we get closer to that event. Most of our, most if not all of our ranger programs this year, we didn't have any last year. So it's really great that we have some this year, but because of the pandemic, social distancing and just safety, you need to pre-register because a limited number of people are allowed. So um, you would call the visitor center, the list of programs that are already scheduled out are on our website under the Ranger Programming section. And then you'd call the Visitor Center to sign up for that event. All right, looks like we're planning a visit to Great Sand Dunes. Um, so what about in our own backyard? Are there any um, events like night sky events that um, we can see maybe like a meteor shower or is there something coming up that we can test your Ranger tips um, ourselves in our backyards? Yeah, so uh, meteor showers are predicted and they they're the same time of year every year. And what a meteor shower is, it's when the earth it, on its rotation around the sun is going through the path of a comet. And the meteors are actually the debris from the comet. And so it happens every single year at the same time of year. One of the more popular ones in the summer, I mean, they happen all year long. One of the more popular ones in the summertime is actually the Perseid meteor shower. And so the thing about the meteor showers though, is you gotta look at the moon. <laughs> so sometimes the peak of the shower will happen around the time it's a full moon and then you don't see much. But on an average night, tonight for example, you'll see 12 meteors an hour on an average night. So you don't have to wait for a special event or a shower, just get outside and I guarantee you, you'll have a shooting star to wish upon. Excellent. All right, does anybody else have any questions that you'd like to ask of Sydney or Patrick? All right, we'll just wait one second here. So uh, just to let you know that Western National Parks Association, is, we're the official nonprofit partner of 13 National Park Service units certified as International Dark Sky Parks by the International Dark Sky Association. Thir um, I have them listed there for you in the chat and now through Monday online through our online store um, you can get 20% off products from um, our dark sky parks so if you want to visit that and then I like I said I also put um, those 13 parks in the chat for you um, and so yes this session is recorded and it'll um, be up on our YouTube channel in just uh, a little bit and I'll be sending out a survey for you if you don't mind um, uh, filling that out for me and then Sydney there was a request if you could um, provide the links uh, to us um, from your presentation so we can share them with the audience. Yep they're in the chat box. Okay great perfect thank you. All right. All right. So thank well, you. I wanna, Jim, I wanna, do you want to say some parting I just words? I want to thank Sydney and uh, everyone. Please join me in thanking Sydney and Patrick for this wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I'm not supposed to say that we have favorite parks, but I will personally say that uh, Great Sand Dunes is one of my personal favorites. And the team there is so wonderful, uh, including Sydney and Patrick. and. It is quite an adventure, uh, quite a thrill to go uh, to that park. So I encourage everyone to visit that. Well, thanks for letting us experience this virtually and, and uh, great to see everybody. We thank you for your support and take care. Bye-bye. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. Thank you so much, Patrick. This is amazing. And then Patrick, if you, um, if it's possible to get the NASA landings on the other moons and planets, and um, if there's a link that you could share with me that people could um, watch that on their own again. Oh, I think you're muted. You're still Patrick. on mute, Patrick.
There we go. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, Na NASA's website has uh, all their video clips and things like that. So just go on nasa.gov and you can find okay. almost all these uh, video clips. All right, I'll find some examples to share with some people. All right, yes, so coming through the chat, thank you so much, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks everyone, take care.